Great. Um, so my name is Holmes. Um, I'm one of the founders of an activist group called Fight for the Future uh, that works in the US on issues like privacy and net neutrality. But now what I'm working on is a team chat app called Quiet that's built on IPFS and lib P2P. Um, so Quiet is a Slack alternative for desktop and for mobile that's built on IPFS, OrbitDB, and Tor that uses Tor Onion, servers in, Tor Onion services instead of servers. We don't use servers at all, other than the Tor network. So the thing that makes Quiet unique is that um, we're doing private libp2p and IPFS networks over Tor. Each team has its own private network. I'm not aware of too many projects doing this. I would be interested to, to learn if there is anyone. Um, that also lets us do pure peer-to-peer -peer networks without any help from servers like signaling servers or hole punching servers or trackers or um, you know, backup storage servers for messages. It also lets us do peer-to-peer -peer on Android and iOS. We have full peer-to-peer -peer working on Android and iOS with JS IPFS running in Node.js. And um, while the iOS version doesn't uh, run in the background because Apple doesn't allow that, Apple sort of sucks <laughs> and, and limits a lot about what developers can do uh, with peer-to-peer -peer on mobile. Um, Android is always on and runs as a full peer-to-peer -peer iOS node. And I actually have it running here and I'm gonna show it to you as part of my demo. Um, so, uh, so also from the user's perspective, just joining a quiet community is easier, I think, than starting and joining a Slack. Um, they don't need to enter an email address or go through a sign-up process that's as complicated as Slack. They just download an app, paste in an invite code, and, um, and I think the promise for users is that they can control all of their own data without running any of their own infrastructure, the way they would have to with something like, like Matrix or Mattermost. You kind of have to, have to choose between, okay, do I really want to set up my own matrix service and maintain that, and is that even really more secure than Google? Um, Quiet lets people not have to face that dilemma. So um, here's, I'm just gonna run through how it works and then I'll do a demo. Um, the basics of how it works is that each team has its own totally private IPFS network that's based on each member knowing each other's onion addresses and just connecting to peers that they know um, over Tor. Uh, they connect with Tor and libp2p. We use a modified version of the libp2p WebSockets transport. Um, just kind of mash that up with Tor. It's very unsophisticated, and we would love like a first-class Tor transport, um, but it's working for us. Um, and each connection is authenticated with a certificate from the community owner, so peers don't accept incoming connections from peers they don't know. Um, and uh, we use OrbitDB for messaging. The way sending a message works is you add, uh, um, you give a message to OrbitDB, it adds it to the local state, it calculates a hash and gossips that over uh, PubSub, libp2p PubSub, and then peers fetch that with BitSwap. And that all happens within the private IPFS network. It's not happening on the global IPFS network at all, so you get really great privacy properties for users like my former activism organization. Um, and uh, so how sending files works is the sender pins the file, puts the CID in a message like any other message. Everybody fetches and pins all files under a certain threshold, and over a certain threshold, we fetch files just with user intervention. Um, and some point soon, we haven't, we haven't done this yet, but in order to make this like sustainable and also more private, we're going to add retention limits on messages. So you don't just like fill up every user's device with all of the messages that have ever been sent. And also so that people who have uh, privacy, or people who are using the app for its privacy properties can have strong retention limits because those are really fundamental for anybody doing real, real world private sensitive communication. You need to be able to know that things will be deleted after a certain amount of time. So auto deletion is, uh, is a feature, not a bug for people who care about privacy. Um, adding members is the place where we're still working on things and it's a little bit rougher, but the way it works right now, and this is kind of a simple version of how it will work, is the invitation code is an onion address. Um, someone, you would send that to someone via Signal or WhatsApp. Like if I got the onion address sent to me on my phone, I would copy it and I would paste it into the app. That would connect me to the uh, community owner who invited me's node. And then I would do an onboarding dance with them or I would send a certificate signing request to them with my username and they would send it back with all the information I need to join the network. Then I would sync to OrbitDB and pull down the list of all the other peers and I would be a full-fledged member of the network. Oh, and meanwhile, the owner would broadcast my information to all the other peers so they would know how to connect to me in the future. Um, and that user table is synced just with an IPFS-based CRTT like all the messages. So if you miss something while you're 
offline. When you come back online, you'll fetch everything you missed. Um, and so a lot of people ask, why Tor? Well, it's cool because it simplifies peer discovery, because Onion addresses are forever. They're just a public and private key pair. Um, it also solves NAT traversal, because Tor is making an outgoing connection from your device to the world. It's not like you don't need to actually receive an incoming connection, even though in, you're receiving an incoming connection without having to have that happen under the hood, so we don't have to worry about firewalls. And it provides some basic end-to-end -end encryption and metadata protection. Um, and I think from the user's standpoint, Tor is great because without something like Tor or a mixed net, peer-to-peer -peer networks are kind of sketchy for privacy. Like, you're leaking a lot of data by gossiping all the time about what you're looking for and, and who you're connected with. And also, I think Tor, for people in the security community, is, and, and for users themselves to some degree, is a known and trusted thing. People basically have some familiarity, familiarity with how it works as a starting point. So if they know an app is built on Tor, they can reason about its privacy and security properties. Um, so yeah, private networks gives us a clear privacy story for users, but it also gives us better performance. Like on mobile, if we were connecting to the, the global IPFS network, uh, it would kill our battery in a second. As it is, we have a totally unoptimized version of our desktop peer-to-peer -peer stack working on mobile that we haven't even, you know, we haven't done any optimizations yet, and it uses maybe 10% or 20% of the battery in a day when it's just like in the background, which isn't good, but we should be able to reduce that a lot, and it's not that bad. Um, so yeah, we can have full uh, P2P nodes running on Android. Um, yeah, it's cool. Uh, and so, oh, whoops, um, I will give a demo now. I'm gonna switch to, or I guess I can talk about this slide. This is pretty much our, our wish list now. Um, the things we would like from the IPFS community are a well-funded and audited IPFS CRDT. We're using Orbit, OrbitDB now, but it hasn't received a security audit, and there isn't a lot of funding for the people working on it. Um, we would also love a CRDT that supported deletion and encrypted groups. There isn't anything that does that yet, so we'll, we're gonna have to hack our own. So for the one big reliability issue we have right now is, uh, is that Tor has a known bug where onion addresses are taking a very long time to connect. Once they're connected, it's fast, but the initial connection can take some time. This shows up mostly when someone is first joining the network. It can take like many minutes to connect, and it's super annoying. Um, but once someone is already a part of the network, we find it's fairly, fairly reliable, and we have a, um, a test suite. Pretty much all of the peer-to-peer the -peer backend up to state management, we, we can kind of run it in headless mode and spin up many of them and test to see how it behaves. And we've tested it with up to 250 um, users, and it behaves well. Like, our own front-end code is still a little slow, but we had that many users and that many messages, but, um, but it's fine for smaller teams. But the underlying stack is reliable up to hundreds of people using it. Yeah. yeah. Um, two probably quite simple questions. So first of all, this code is open source. Uh, is it? or? Yeah. Um, OK. Tr Tryquiet.org, and there's a link to our GitHub. Um, the second question is, so Orbit, D you're using the CRDT, and the CRDT is uh, like Orbit DB's CRDT? Is yes. It? And that doesn't have a delete operation? That's correct. OK. And it? So what we could do, well, it, you can delete entire like DBs. We could just drop an entire table. So we could hack uh, deletion of old messages by saying, OK, every, uh, every channel is a set of, um, of like chunks, maybe divided by week, say. And then we could drop weeks once they pass by a certain time threshold. Does that make sense? Or you could do that for days. So we could set some time interval and break everything, all the messages up by that time interval for a channel and then drop old intervals. So that's a way we could currently delete things in OrbitDB. But once something is in an OrbitDB log, you can't delete an individual thing in the log or the tail of the log, as I understand it. You'd have to delete the whole log. OK, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and so, so I think like the way a CRDT would support deletion would be to put the in what we could hack on top of OrbitDB, but it'd be better if the CRDT did it, would be to put the um, put a CID pointing to the contents of the message in the log, rather than putting the contents of the message in the log. And then you would be able to, uh, to ask everyone to unpin that message in order to delete it. The entry would remain in the log, but the content would be deleted. Basically, treat, do it, treat it the way we currently treat files. Does yeah, that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so something like that. Um, 
two questions. First question is, uh, what's the threat model of your users who would prefer this compared to like a signal group? Um, second question is more, more technical. Um, since you're running every peer as a Tor hidden service, does that mean that the peer has to be always online to receive messages? And what happens if I'm offline, which happens quite frequently when I'm running it on my phone, right? Of course, yeah. So I'll answer the second question first. The second question is the reason why we use a CRDT. So using a CRDT means that if you go offline momentarily, when you return online, you'll exchange heads with, other, with one of the other peers in the network. And if their heads differ from yours, you'll know that there are messages you're not aware of, and you'll start fetching those messages. And that happens very fast. So you, it, it's not the IRC thing where when you're offline, you miss messages. It's the Slack thing where you go offline, you come back, you see what happened while you were gone provided that there's continuous liveness between peers. Like every peer kind of has to stay live long enough to sort of pass the baton of latest messages to the next peer. But provided you have that continuous liveness, you're good. Um, and if there isn't that liveness, it will sort of partition and you'll get some messages coming in a bit later when that part of the network connects to your part of the network. Um, which isn't great, but we've, we actually thought that would be more annoying than it actually is. We found that since most people, you know, you're working at the same time as other people, it's usually not an issue. Um, okay, so to answer your first question, um, the threat model that we're building for is, is similar to signals, I would say. Like, people want confidentiality, um, and that's the main thing that, that we, we feel people want. The one thing we offer now that signal doesn't yet but will in the future is you don't need to link it to your phone number. So, for example, if a phone is seized right now with signal, um, the authorities that seized it get your, your number and all, or get your entire social graph because they can see all the contacts that you communicate with in the groups that you're active in if they unlock your phone. Whereas with Quiet, they would not be able to do that. Signal will fix that at some point. But I think the main value add for users is that um, there isn't really a signal for teams yet or there isn't a clear winner there. You have Matrix and Mattermost and Wire and most of these depend on some type of centralization, uh, trusting some type of central service or running your own, and Quiet gives you the team chat UX without requiring that people trust a central service or run their own stuff. Um, Hi. Um, so does, I'm sorry. Do, does this support um, multi-device? So can I join a group or a chat with multiple devices with the same user, or does that mean that I have two users to to log into one device, yeah. to one channel. Currently in, the, currently in like the prototypey state we're in now, it's the latter. Um, I just have like an account for my phone called Each Holmes account. Phone and an account on my computer called Holmes. Um, but that's obviously not what we're shooting for. So that's one of the things we plan to implement is multi-device support. And um, you know, it will be something like sync, uh, a QR code appears and you use that to sync um, keys and it will function under the hood something similarly to a private group. Um, and another question is how, is it possible to, cha to share messages between channels? Like I can refer to a message to another channel in, or something like that? I, we, we, we haven't done that yet. And on tryquiet.org, there's a list of what we've implemented and okay. what we plan to implement. That is not yet even in the th list of things we plan to implement, but it is a, it is a cool feature. Awesome. But, but that wouldn't be, you know, that reference wouldn't be usable outside of the community, of course, because it's not, it's not like... It's a private, yeah, yeah it's yeah, a private yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. You said that the user is owner of the data. So I was wondering if there is any solution like uh, for plausibility, deniability, or if the user uh, is crossing the border. So how... Mm -hmm. How do you fix this, this problem? I mean, they delete the application and then they can download the data yeah. again or not? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't tackled account recovery yet. I think, honestly, like, account recovery is probably the hardest like, problem in all of like, Web3 usability right now, I would say. Um, and our starting point will just be everyone else's, which is you can make a paper backup or back up your keys somewhere else. Um, and in the crossing the border case, you would be able to send your keys in some way securely across the border separate from you, delete everything from your device, and then recover once you arrived at your destination. 
Um, we're also planning on making it so that uh, because this is like a team chat structure and not an individual chat structure like Signal, we can give the team owner a lot of power to help people restore their accounts. We don't want to let them impersonate users, um, but we, we can, um, uh, you know, you can just get an invite from the team owner again. You could delete everything, get an invite for the team owner again, and rejoin with a new username, worst case scenario. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, I have a question. So you said this is a chat for teams, but regular data deletion is a feature. Yes. Uh, so my, my view of a chat for teams is that you want to keep data because you want to refer to it at a later point. You might have discussed something that's important for wherever you're working on. So how, how do you make this connection to, to a longer lifespan use by teams? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a limitation of this approach. I, um, I think, well, first of all, uh, if it's just text messages we're talking about and the team is small, you can retain messages for quite a while. You know, you could retain messages for months or a year without filling up a device. If the team is big and the channel is very active, you'd fill up a device quickly. Um, the, I guess I should step back and say the reason why I think this approach is worth pursuing even if there are drawbacks, and it's that I think open source software really hit a wall with the cloud where once we started depending on servers controlled by other people, we lost a lot of the privacy and freedom guarantees that free and open source software was built to give us, and we have not solved that problem yet. And crypto and blockchain and decentralized tech exist to solve that problem, but we have not solved it yet for end user apps. To solve it for end user apps, I think we need to build apps that can run autonomously on people's own phones and give them as much functionality as we possibly can before we make them turn to a server. Because as soon as they turn to a server, they lose the privacy and freedom guarantees that free software gives them, and we're back in the Web 2 hellscape. So I think, um, I think it's worth pursuing this and trying to find product market fit with a product that has these limitations, even if we know that some users out there want to back up all their messages forever and ever and ever. Also, I think there's a ton of organizations out there that are back keeping their messages forever that are foot gunning themselves by doing that. Because as soon as you get, as soon as you're in a lawsuit, as soon as, um, you know, it could be an HR thing, it could be something about copyright or the government or, you know, for, for Web3 and crypto companies, the SEC or something like that, as soon as there's any legal risk, all that stuff is going into discovery and massively increases your exposure. Um, as soon as, if you're doing any type of sensitive work, all that stuff could get spilled out and create months of headaches if it's like showing up in the press. Um, that happened to my organization. We, we were attacked by a mercenary hacker for hire group that was paid for by some of our adversaries. We're not sure exactly who, but we knew who the group was eventually that attra attacked us. And yeah, they're looking for in internal comms that they can spill out on the internet in order to try to discredit us. And every organization has some indiscreet conversations in their Slack. And every manager knows that that's true. Every founder knows that that's true and has nightmares about that scenario where it all gets spilled out. So I think there's some user education that could get us to the point where we can make deletion a feature and not a bug. Mm 